Yo, what's up, guys? Here we go into uh, round one of uh, Lil J versus Jose Angel Rodriguez. Uh, this fight is from 2003. Unfortunately, it's a little bit old, and it's not going to be indicative of like kind of the newer Charlo, um, the one who's been training with um, I don't know that boy's name, but he trains uh, Errol Spence, right? And and in the last three fights that he's been training Errol Spence. Um, he's gotten a lot of uh, a lot more knockouts, a lot more power on his resume. Um, he's been looking really good, you know. He's always looked good, you know, from a technical standpoint. He's always, you know, he's got great tools. He's fast. He hits hard. He's sharp. Um, uh, and you know, I, I, I guess he was a good amateur along with his brother. Um, but I don't know too much about them to be honest. Um, uh, and this was like a special request video from somebody. Someone sent me a private message. I'm sorry, I'm blinking on your name. But um, um, it's going to be an interesting fight regardless. Uh, and the Charlie brothers are like, uh, well, first off, um, Fox Sports owns the content that I'm going to be uh, breaking down and analyzing. My use of this content is protected under the Fair Act use uh, for commentary criticism and gaining a new and interesting perspective on the fight. Um, and with that said, um, the Charlo brothers are very interesting uh, because there have very rarely been two brothers, let alone twins, that are you know near championship level um, uh, in the in the sport of boxing. You know you've got um, Miguel Cotto, and he's got his younger brother, maybe his older brother, that fought uh, um, Canelo a few years ago, but we've never seen that guy since. He got, he, I think he got knocked out. Uh, I know he got knocked out. Um, then there was, I think Manny Pacquiao had a little brother that boxed. You know, who knows that guy? Uh, maybe older brother. I don't know. You know, but but it's very rare. It's kind of, you know, it, it's just a really interesting storyline. And being able to press it, it'd be really interesting if they still fought in the same division. Um, nothing, there hasn't been anything nearly as successful as the Klitschko brothers uh, for many, many, many years. But um, we're going to be looking at, at the Charlo brothers. And in my opinion, they're, they're green fighters. Um, I know you guys You guys didn't even like that I called Erickson Lubin The guy who has 18 fights You know, green Because he has like 170 amateur fights But his professional style, style It lacks craft You know, he's, he's working on it But there's an important reason like, like Gervonta Tank Davis Why isn't he fighting Lomachenko? Right? Because he's green Everybody knows it Right? He was an amateur star But he's not fighting Lomachenko Because he's green You know, he's there, I did an interesting video, Evolution of a Fighter. I'm not sure if it was taken down or if it's still up, but it's on my channel. And it shows how much better he got in the course of three fights. How much better of a fighter he got. And it was amazing. And if they would have just thrown him, you know, 11 fights, 12 fights in against Lomachenko, who had had two or three at the time, he would have got murdered. And, and, and Tank Davis would be nobody. You know, there's a, a great importance in developing yourself as a fighter and learning crafts. You know that Roy Jones Jr. said the the most goddamn amazing thing I've ever heard him say. You know, and I never agree with Roy Jones Jr. Most of the time, I think the shit that he says is ridiculous. Um, but again, you know, it's hard for him to be an analyst and to never ever disagree with Jim Lampley. Or you know, it's hard to have a team like that and say stuff that's you know keep the broadcast going. So you know, there's a lot of forgiveness. But um, there was a fighter. Was it on, on the Canelo uh, Golovkin undercard? There was a fighter that was fighting um, some guy, and it was like some amateur star, you know, this, this, and that. And there, Jim Lampley's like, why isn't he doing this? Why isn't he doing that? And then Roy Jones goes, simply says, because he doesn't know how yet, Jim. That's why he's taking these fights. And it's so important to develop yourself as a fighter and learn the difference because there are completely different rules for boxing uh, as a professional than as an amateur, you know, a lot of that stuff like probing and controlling your opponent with your forearms and stuff, you're not allowed to do that in the amateurs. The amateurs are just such a strange boxing system, you know, it's like keep your hands to yourself unless you're punching your opponent in the face, you know, they don't recognize that it's a fight, right? You don't start fighting people until you get to the pros. Before that, it's all it's all boxing. It's all nearly like exhibition level stuff. You know, oh, I got a point. I touched you, right? Whereas in professional boxing, you know, you might touch your opponent, but you don't get any points for that. Like there are points in 
in the Golovkin Canelo fight where Golovkin is standing in front of Canelo, probing him and touching him with his jab. Not real punches, but just probing him. And they do, they do no damage. But in the amateurs, you would get credit for that as a punch. You know, I know some people tried to give him credit for that as a punch, but it's not. You don't get credit for that in the professional ranks. Anyway, after you have 170 fights in the amateur system, you're going to be very geared towards fighting like an amateur. You know, so much of it is based on just landing or just touching them that you have to develop a completely new style, right? 170 fights that you kind of have to wipe the slate clean and develop a professional style because they are such different sports. So yes, I think that Erickson Lubin is a very green fighter. He has a long way to go. As long as he doesn't give up on himself and he trains and works hard, you know, he has the potential, right? That's the amateur pedigree, right? But the same with the Charlo brothers, you know, and I think, I don't know how many fights that uh, Lil J has, almost 30, right? 28, 29, maybe it's 26, I don't know. But I like the development of him. I like that he's taking his time to learn things as he goes through the, the ranks. Um, and even more so now, now that he's training with uh, a different coach. You know, I think that that's integral for any fighter's development is changing trainers at some point, uh, learning something that you're not doing, you know, learning something new. Um, and I really, really appreciate that, that Lil J has taken that step in his career uh, and is training with um, uh, Errol Spence's trainer, uh, which is, and I'll talk about this at the end of the fight. Um, well, I'll probably wind up talking about it during the course of the fight. It's really interesting. But him training and sparring with Errol Spence, especially after I make the comparisons without knowing anything about Erickson Lubin to Errol Spence, is going to be a huge advantage, a huge intangible advantage for uh, for Charlo when he fights Erickson Lubin because of the fact that their styles are so similar. Um, anyway, go ahead and get into there. You know, I can't really see what's going on in that aspect, but here we got... Charlo coming out, and I like that he takes such small steps. You know, I really appreciate that. Um, he has a kind of a stale guard, right? Like, notice he doesn't move his head a lot, right? It's kind of on the line. Um, but he does have great, like, as you'll see throughout the, the thing, he reacts to punches very well, and I appreciate that. So maybe he'll get away with it a little more. But when you're fighting, like, a southpaw or, like, a, a quick or powerful fighter, you, you need to be able to make sure that they're constantly guessing where your head's going to be, rolling, slipping, you know, doing all those things, but without having to wait for punches to come, because that's when you really get in trouble, is when people pick up on those defensive movements. Oh, he always puts his head this way when I, you know, anyway, getting into it, uh, right off the bat, um, Charlo testing him with the jab. You see him give him a little probing jab and kind of see how he's going to react, and he sees right away that his opponent's going to shell up. Um, then his opponent goes to commit to a shot and what does he do immediately he blocks the jab and then he ducks down right showing that that he knows that the left hand is coming right behind it right nobody ever sees the left hand coming so he's being very uh, responsible for it taking small steps to his left also very smart and shooting the jab and I really like this from him he doesn't step all the way inside you know we saw Lubin yesterday or two days ago, stepping all the way on the inside with his lead foot on the inside of his opponent's lead foot to land his jab. Landing your jab in this fight is not important. You know, you want it to be more of a cross and go around your opponent's guard or a right hook, right? But landing the jab is actually not very easy. Especially if you if you if they are able to time your jab when you do that and slip to the outside and catch you with their own straight left or straight right, vi uh, vice versa, right? Depending on who's throwing the jab. Um, but stepping on the inside is just a huge misnomer in my opinion. Now, um, I like this from, from Charlo, trying to make sure that he doesn't gain control of that space, right? Um, his opponent's jabbing at him and he tries to catch them and push the jab off, you know, not allowing him to control him and control that space. You know, it's really, really important, especially when you're fighting a lead, uh, a southpaw versus an orthodox fighter, that someone is controlling the space because whoever has control of the space is going to be able to take lead foot dominance. It's really important. Now, Charlo going to the body, and look at, this is really nice. I like this a lot. When he comes in with the jab, he does kind of lead his... 
um, his right hand get away from his face when he goes to the body. But look at how far out he circles after throwing the shot. You know, really far off the line and in no danger to kind of really get countered, right? If his opponent timed it really well, he might be able to catch him with a straight left on the top of the head or like maybe like a, a weird arcing down right hook, but not really in a lot of danger as he, as he traverses the ring in that regard. Ooh, now this is something that you don't like, that you don't want to see. So, so far, um, he's been actively dodging the left hand, right, and moving really well, uh, but here he gets kind of stagnant, you know, I don't think he's, he's expecting his opponent to kind of come in with, um, with any kind of offense, but I don't think he notices that his opponent takes lead foot dominance here, and he throws the, the two to the body, then the right hook upstairs, which, you know, looks like it lands kind of, but although he is very um, aware that the straight left is going to be coming from his opponent, he rolls, he, so he ducks the, the straight left, whoops, rolls this way, but then this is a huge problem, right? So from this position, he needs to be controlling his opponent, pushing off of him with his right arm, and then pivoting out. But instead, he gives it another roll and comes up in a horrible position and gets kind of clocked with the with the left hand. You know, that's a little positional mistake. That's something that I don't think that he's going to have any problems with anymore uh, because I'm pretty sure that if he does that shit against Errol Spence, Errol Spence makes him fucking pay. Um, and that's like a huge advantage that he's going to have being able to spar with such a high-level, um, well-tooled fighter like Errol Spence. But uh, coming in, and now this is really interesting. Um, I think that he starts to time this guy, you know, and he has like a really amateur style, you know, his opponent. I don't know anything about him, but as you can see, he leans forward like, you know, a lot of like... A lot of fighters do when they're coming in, they're, they're leaning forward, they step on their lead foot, right? And then they throw punches off of that lead foot. And he kind of gets timed with the jab right here. And, as a, and um, Charlo is able to time it really well. But just watch as he, as he um, whoops, just watch as he rocks forward and he lets his hands go. I guess he doesn't really do it there, but there'll be other times. Um, but right here, this is really interesting. So. Charlo has already shown when he throws jabs at this guy that this guy just kind of shells up and doesn't try to control the jab. He doesn't look to um, make sure that he can see his opponent, right? Like, see how he shells up right here? And Charlo is easily able to take lead foot dominance off of this without putting himself out of position off this jab, right? It's like a kind of a controlling jab. He doesn't really... It's committed in the fact that he extends it all the way, but he doesn't throw any power onto it. It's only to gain lead foot advantage, right? But this is really interesting. This really surprised me. Look how he throws the second punch to his opponent's glove to keep his hand there. You know, really smart. And then throws the body shot, which is his opponent's able to see coming. And then I watched this probably like 10 times, thinking every single time that it was going to be a left to the a left to the body. And I think maybe he was trying to bait his opponent in, thinking it was a left to the body, but he goes upstairs with it as a right hook. Um, you know, but a really good, um, you know, setup to it after he's shown the lead hand to his opponent a few times, right? And seen how he reacts to it. We just went back like 20 seconds on purpose. I'm hoping that Charlo will throw a jab. But right there, showing that he's not his opponent is not looking to counter his jab. He's just trying to move away and get away from the lead or the get away from the one two, right? And he kind of gives up that um oh and that's another thing. After his opponent's jab, again, he ducks after the left hand. Very responsible defense and understanding what's going to come after, what's coming next. Uh, and is able to set up this offense off of kind of his, his probing jabs, right? And they're not really probing. His opponent could counter them. Um, but I like the fact that this is part of his craft, that this is where he's going with his offense. So this is going to be something that we look for um, uh, during the course of the fight, is him taking a positional advantage on his opponent and setting up his punches. Um, but I also like that after he controls him with the jab, you know, this is some stuff that I didn't really expect from him after watching him fight um, right-handed fighters, like watching how slow the, the pacing was against uh, Charles Hatley, who it says that he's a, a southpaw, but he fights orthodox as well. Um, but, but again, um, 
so much more is mainstream about what is left-handed and right-handed, what is controlling your opponent. You know, people, for the most part, fight above their average skill level when fighting a southpaw, when they're an orthodox fighter, just because so much more of that knowledge is common. Um, so I really, I do really like where uh, Charlo goes from this instance um, of establishing lead foot dominance and how he does it. He doesn't just like, um, he doesn't just throw that punch and immediately take uh, lead foot dominance. He gives him another punch to control his glove to make sure that he's not countering and then goes into it and then turns off uh, and controls him on the way out. Again, really smart. His opponent comes in off that jab, very predictable. And what does he do? He ducks the straight left hand. You know. Now one of the problems with that again is um, there may be times where he finds himself being timed where his opponent can throw that probing jab or that lead jab and then bait him into ducking and throw a straight, a hard straight left uh, because he doesn't have normal natural head movement um, and his head kind of always goes in the same spot. There are going to be times where he may be able to be timed and I'm not sure if we saw any of that in Lubin's fight where he's able to make his opponent slip a shot where he wants him to slip it and then catch him with the shot but that is a very high level technique um, and we'll see if uh, Lubin is able to take advantage of it. Ooh, now this time Again, he's able to get under the left hand uh, very easily. He knows that it's coming because his opponent throws the jab, right? Boom, slips under it. But notice how he turns off of his opponent this time. Uh, and it looks like he might be controlling him with his elbow this time as well. But instead of ducking and rolling and slipping under and trying to be like, have that like, oh, I have the perfect defense. I can see every punch coming without having to without trying to rely on that, you know, and that's something you want to train, but it's not something you want to have to do. Um, he's able to body up with him and then push off and create space while moving off the line, right? To stop him from having an, an awkward engagement like he did earlier in the round where he got kind of tagged with the left hand for no reason. So I really appreciate that he's making that adjustment. And now here we see uh, an example of him, of his opponent, um, Stepping forward with the jab, rocking forward with the jab, rocking forward with the jab, uh, and starting to put himself into a rhythm, right? One that's going to be able to be easily exposed. Um, it's very common in boxing for fighters to have rhythms like this, as you saw David Lemieux has one, Canelo has one, um, Gary Russell Jr. had one. You know, it's just very common that fighters kind of get into that mindset where they're punching off of one foot or the other and not just constantly shuffling forward or sliding in or whatever but they walk and they're I don't want to say have lazy footwork but um but it's a it's a very easy thing to time um and Charlo starts to time it right here where he sees it coming sees it coming and then his opponent goes to lean forward and shoot the same jab and he eats a body shot right so now he's he's actively looking to take away his opponent's ability to control the distance and unfortunately for his opponent um, he doesn't really know what to do with the distance that he has or the control over the distance that he has, right? Because if these are not really probing shots. He is touching him and kind of committing to it, right? As you see, he's touching his glove, touching his glove. But when when Charlo reacts in, in a way that, that would be favorable to him, right, putting himself out of position, he doesn't counter with a straight left hand that he could have been setting him up for. He doesn't counter with a right hook. He doesn't or uh, yeah, a right hook. He doesn't counter him at all, so it shows that he doesn't. His opponent doesn't really know what he's doing with that con with the control. Um, whereas we're able to learn that Charlo knows that he doesn't want his opponent to have that control in the first place. And there he is parrying the lead hand, and again he knows how to time uh, his opponent, and then beautiful times him he leans forward and he times him and follows him back to his jab and that's again so just like I was saying earlier when you're able to uh, predict your opponent's movements or you predict your, what your opponent's trying to do um, just in the same way that he's able to predict that uh, Rodriguez is going to punch at this time and he's gonna be able to follow him back with the lead with the jab um, he could shoot that jab and then feint the right hand and get him to duck to where he or the left hand and feint him into a position where he could land punches in the same way that Charlo is is baiting him and setting him up for shots too right boom and then takes lead foot dominance because he knows his opponent is not looking to counter him and lands possibly a, a right hand right there I'm not sure but lands a great 
left hand to the body right there, and then another left hand to the body. His opponent kind of gives him a dirty look, you know, like, whatever, bro. But I'll be honest, I don't care how hard some guy hits, I don't want him hitting me to the body like that. So, you know, Charlo's showing some good skills. Again, ducking, getting away from the possible left hand, right? But Charlo's showing some good skills with uh, timing his opponent. Um, so far, he's showed two different timings, which really surprises me, right? He showed the one, the jab to the body, um, then following him back with the jab to the head, taking lead foot dominance. You know, some pretty, some pretty high-level stuff. You know, it shows that he has at least some craft when fighting a southpaw fighter uh, and that he knows how he wants to attack him. And so far, I really appreciate it. Although it's mostly uh, based on... I don't want to say waiting for his opponent necessarily, um, but it's not as proactive as I would like it to be uh, personally. But again, beautiful timing, right? It doesn't land, right? But he sees him lean forward on that front leg, leans forward on that front leg. He sees that shot coming, follows him back with the straight, uh, with the straight right. And even though it doesn't land, that's not the point. It doesn't matter whether it lands. Um, but this is an avenue that he's looking to. Uh, set up his offense and that's why it's important and we'll see how that kind of Translates when he fights uh, Erickson Lubin right and when I re go over Lubin's film study and look for weaknesses um, Or things that he might be able to exploit um, uh, Against Erickson Lubin uh, with these kinds of techniques But so far and again, right? Stopping his opponent from maintaining control of the distance between him. This is something that I really, really like from uh, Charlo. I think it's really high level. A lot of times fighters will see that punch or see that lead hand coming at them, right? And they'll just try to move their head and dodge around it and, you know, you know, bat it away a little bit, you know? But I love the way that he's forcing that hand away from him um, and not allowing him to uh, to maintain control, even though I don't think his opponent knows what to do with that control of the space. And I love that again. Uh, so his opponent leans forward, shoots the jab out, leans back. And then when he leans forward, um, Charlo is, again, looking to shoot the, the jab to the body under where he, when he thought his opponent was going to jab, right? But again, he sees that his opponent's not shooting a punch off of that shot anyway, and that's his normal rhythm movement. And he's taking advantage of those deficiencies in his opponent's, um, you know, I'll say his talent pool, his skills, um, or his tools. Again, beautiful. His opponent leans in. And now, uh, rather than just stopping his opponent from maintaining the distance or controlling his opponent and controlling the distance, he's looking to control the distance and pin his opponent's glove to his head. Really interesting. You know, I haven't watched... Um, I've only watched the Charlo Brothers' uh, more recent fights, and I've never seen them use uh, skills like this. I really appreciate that from, from this Charlo guy, from, from Lil J. And I hope that name sticks, man. If you guys can go to, like, some other boxing channels and shit and just be like, yo, Lil J's the shit, man. And they'll be like, who? Lil J. You know, just, just throw it out there, you know. That'd be funny as fuck. But anyway, um, again, maintaining the distance, right? Again, knowing that, you know, and I wonder what his tell is. Oh, okay. So his tell, his opponent's tell when he's actually going to follow it up is... He shoots forward and he steps with his jab. He steps with his lead hand. And that's why that's why when when he's here and his opponent is he's not moving his head. Sorry, I'm getting a text. Uh, that's why he's not after this jab, that's why Charlo doesn't move his head and duck or slip the left hand, is because his opponent is not uh, stepping with the lead hand and taking lead foot dominance. So far his opponent, it looks like his opponent is only thrown the lead uh thrown the left hand after taking lead foot dominance and that's when charlo knows when he needs to be slipping a shot and not bad defense right there so gets under that shot uh he should look to body up a little more with his opponent right but he does a great job of seeing that punch coming and rolling it and then moving off the line uh it looks like his opponent might land that right hand to the body Um, and from this position, also, so the, the right hook doesn't come, right? So he knows that it's still looking to come, right? So right here, 
he should be bodying up with his opponent and then pivoting out to the right rather than coming up into the right hook, right? I might have said left hand, I might have said right hand a second ago and I meant left hand, um, but he should have been pivoting out the other side uh, just to make sure. And again, I think that these are these are things that he's going to iron out by having this, the opportunity to, to train and spar with uh, Errol Spence. Because of the fact that Errol Spence, whenever his opponent, like uh, in the Chris Algieri fight, whenever Chris Algieri would circle out this same way, Errol Spence would pound the crap out of him. And I really don't think that, that this is a habit that he's going to hold on to uh, during the course of his new fight. And I think that, to be honest, uh, training with Errol Spence is probably going to be the biggest factor in him uh, beating Erickson Lubin. Uh, so far, I'm, I am in the camp, even though the film study is not done, I am in the camp that I think that Charlo was just going to be a little too much for him, a little too seasoned, even though I think Charlo's a little green as well. Um, I think that having the advantage of having a, a fighter like that in your camp is just tremendous, uh, especially since they are so similar in the ways that uh, they're both good on the on the outside or on the inside and the way that they work their way on uh, onto the inside in the first place. Oh man, beautiful, beautiful timing. So he's able to see that shot coming so well. Um, I don't like exactly how he just leans back to get away from it, right? But timing that shot so well and landing that right, um, that right hand. And that's because of the fact that his opponent is probing, probing, right? But he doesn't do anything with the probe, right? He didn't get his opponent to react in any way. So it's basically like he just threw a lead left hand and his opponent got to see it coming a mile away. Even though he was trying to set it up, he was trying to probe, he didn't step first to bait Charlo into ducking down away from the shot so he could land the straight left. Uh, he just kind of threw it from where he was, and you know, basically it's completely telegraphed from this part, and uh, Charlo has a great counter to it, and beautiful right after, lands that shot, and turns him out and controls him with his left hand after, and then moves off the line so he's no longer in danger. You know, great work from, from Mr. Charlo here. Oh, man. Beautiful, you guys. And we're just going to watch this whole thing. Just great work from Charlo. And I really appreciate that, that in this fight, at least, he's not spending so much time waiting for his opponent to make a mistake. You know, that's, a, that's one of the... One of the problems that I find with most boxing and most most fighters is that it's a it's been a very common mantra over the last 20 years in boxing: be patient and wait for your opponent to make a mistake. And um, that's why Loma, fighters like Lomachenko are so exciting, is they're breaking that mold and they're looking to make you make mistakes rather than waiting for you to make mistakes. Um, and that's you know fighters that do that that usually wait for you to make mistakes. Those are very limited fighters in my opinion. So I really appreciate that uh, Charlo is taking the initiative. Okay, so going, getting back into the film study, goes to the body, and then sees his opponent lean forward and controls his lead hand again while he's moving out. I really like this. After he shoots his jab, goes to control his opponent on the way out, not just coming straight back. Um, so that'll be, that'll be something that'll be um, really helpful for him uh, when fighting Lubin because Lubin does like to counter the jab with the right hook. So maybe he'll be able to find some success or some ability to stop that right hook from coming by controlling his opponent or understanding at least that he needs to control him after shooting a punch, especially if it's blocked or whatever. Um, but that is something that he's going to need to look out for. So getting back into it, sorry. Boom. And then, whoops, shit, I missed it again. So he leans forward, shoots the jab, shoots the jab, and now he times him with the one, two, and I love how he shoots that really interesting timing. I wonder, you know, to be honest, I don't know exactly what prompt him to, to make this play, right, to, to try this, right? Because his opponent looks like he's fighting off rhythm now. Right? He does know that his opponent is not going to take lead foot dominance uh, because he's not stepping with the jab. Right, So it doesn't look like his opponent's going to be throwing a, his own straight left hand. So he does have the opportunity to kind of do this. But it's really interesting. 
So he does that, and he takes lead foot dominance at the same time, misses the right hand, and I love how he shifts forward while throwing the right hook. And um, lands the... Sh I don't know if that's a straight left or exactly what you would call it. But more importantly, after taking lead foot dominance, he doesn't just sit there and allow this guy to smother him right here as he comes up and he turns himself. He doesn't allow him to smother him and takes another angle. Now, this is, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, Lomachenko is so exciting as a fighter uh, because of the fact that he's never happy with just one positional advantage on his opponent. He's constantly looking to take new angles. Right? So your opponent adjusts to this one angle and you don't just bleed that angle out for uh, bleed that angle out dry for punches. Uh, Lomachenko likes to take another angle and make you readjust, right? And that's gonna, you know, sometimes that'll buy you one or two more punches and you can take another angle and that might buy you another punch or two, right? So I really like the fact that, he, that Charlo takes another angle right here to continue setting up his offense rather than just throwing another punch, right? Boom. Rather than throwing another punch from that angle and allowing his opponent to kind of body up and not have it land, after that right hand, he pivots out, and then his opponent comes up and just has no idea where Charlo is, and he just cracks him with that shot. Just beautiful boxing right here. Something I really didn't expect at all. Um, and now I don't agree with taking the second angle, right? Boom. He winds up squaring up with his opponent, right? I think he should have moved to the right, but I really appreciate that he's, he's making these attempts. Uh, just like how he shoots the shot, boom, and takes lead foot dominance again, right, here, and then pivots in again so he can land that shot again, you know. And we'll just watch it, you know. His opponents, you know, if you notice the entire time that his opponent has his high guard up, he's not in position to punch or counter or do anything. So to be honest, uh, Charlo could probably do this to him all fight long. You know, because his opponent's not really looking to counter or take advantage of missed punches or anything. Um, so he could kind of just kind of athlete him out um, and knock him out. So I'm not sure exactly why this fight takes 10 rounds, but, but really interesting. And I really like the fact that he, he takes multiple angles and he's constantly uh, readjusting those angles and not allowing his opponent to body up with him. Ooh beautiful shot so now starting to time his jab again again his opponent let's see if it's still on that rhythm lean forward lean forward stick his lead hand out lean forward tries to stick his lead hand out and what does he do his opponent slips it and lands uh charlo slips it and lands a straight right hand just beautiful doesn't even look like he slips it, it looks like he i don't know i can't really tell because the because it the angle changes. I think he might flash his own lead hand first. Um, but anyway, timing him because of uh, his opponent's poor timing and his, you know, a limited opponent for sure. But the fact that he's he's doing this stuff and he's aware of what is a punch and what is not a punch is going to be very, very relevant against Erickson Lubin. Uh, because as we discussed previously, Erickson Lubin likes to flash the lead hand, take lead foot dominance, and then throw the straight left hand. So if he's able to pick this strategy apart from this guy and know what is a punch and what is not a punch, uh, he'll be able to do it against Lubin as well. And when Lubin flashes that lead hand and he realizes that's not a punch, that's a setup for lead foot dominance, he's going to be able to counter with his own straight right hand. You know, that'll be very a very interesting tension between the two fighters. Who comes out ahead in that regard? Um, boom. And I like the fact that he kind of moves off the line after that shot too. You know, uh, the sign of somebody who has good responsible defense. Now, I don't, again, I don't like the fact that he steps on the inside. I think this might be the first time that he steps on the inside of his opponent's foot. Or maybe he's stepping on his opponent's foot. I'm not exactly sure. The color is not super great. Um, but again, after that jab, when he jabs to the body, moving completely off the line so he's not really out of position. Again... Steps with the jab, his opponent knows, and Charlo knows that the lead left hand might come, right? Or the straight left hand might come. But he comes up in the exact same spot uh, and winds up almost getting caught with the right hook, you know? Um, again, I don't think this is something that he's going to be... Um, 
he's going to be doing against Lubin. I think that Errol Spence will have ironed this out for him uh, in the gym and in their sparring. But if not, it is, a, it is going to be a problematic thing for him um, if he hasn't ironed it out. And again, you know, that's not something he's going to be looking to do. I don't think he's going to have these kind of positional problems against, um, against Lubin. But a little off balance, you know, looks like he has like decent defense, but you never want to be in a position like that where you're slipping shots like that uh, because you're not in a position to counter either. Now, interesting that Charlo is now allowing his opponent to have his lead hand out there, right? He knows the shots are coming, and that kind of tells me that he's looking to counter these shots now rather than just bait them. Oh, there he goes, contesting the, the control. And it's interesting because his opponent doesn't do anything with the control, so it doesn't matter anyway, right? So contesting him, and let's see. So, sorry. So he leans, leans forward, shoots the jab out, and um, Charlo shoots his own jab out as well. Shoots his own jab, gets him to kind of not shell up this time, which he probably expected, which is why he threw the second one. And I can't tell if that, that right hand lands or not, but I love that after he shoots it, boom, he moves completely off the line and pivots out. You know, good responsible defense there. And that'll be something that he really needs to do against uh, against Lubin. Um, but it will be interesting if they do wind up fighting on the inside because Lubin does look like he fights on the inside pretty well. Again, his opponent, you know, not setting up his shot, right? And that's something that's really interesting because Lubin does the same thing. You know, very wide, looping left hand. Uh, someone in the comments section made a point about pointing it out that... Um, that that's going to be a problem for him when he fights Charlo, right? And it doesn't look like his opponent, like Charlo, is looking to make him pay for that shot, even though it was like maybe not even telegraphed, right? But the fact that he's not setting it up means that it was very easily avoidable. And I really like how he closes the distance with him and bodies up with him right here, right? Wraps him up, you know. Maybe you don't want to see him wrap him up, right? But that's not the point. Uh, the, the point is is that he didn't allow his opponent the space to work or to land that left hand. Oh, his, maybe his opponent's figuring something out right there, right? So now his opponent comes in with that lead left hand, steps with it, and sees that he can get Charlo to duck down when he steps with his jab. Maybe in future rounds, he'll take advantage of this. Oh, I think he just tried to right there. Steps steps with the lead hand, but he keeps himself kind of planted, and Charlo doesn't take the bait. And then winds up getting counter to the body as he gives, again, on the same timing, the same rhythm, Charlo's very easily able to land points and kind of stop his opponent from being as probably as active with his lead hand as he wants, although he looks pretty active right here. Um, because of the fact that um, his opponent's not doing anything when Charlo throws punches. He's not countering the jab to the body. He's not countering the straight right hand. Even though it looks like, um, even though it looks like uh, his opponent has control of the distance between them because he's the one punching, um, he, what, he's, what he's really, he really has no control, right? Because of the fact that anytime Charlo really wants to, he can kind of just explode and time him and throw his own shots. You know, so even though Charlo doesn't have control of the space between them, his opponent doesn't either. And again, great angles, shoots that shot, pivots out, shoots more shots, turns out again. Uh, even though they're not landing, it's really important and really valuable that he knows how to do that and that he's able to do it. And that's the end of the round. Uh, you know, an interesting round. Um, a lot of it predicated off of his opponent's, uh, you know, foe establishing lead hand dominance and Charlo being able to take advantage of it. Uh, Charlo being able to take advantage of that, that crappy jab and that crappy lead hand um, in numerous ways. You know, straight right hands, 
um, you know, one twos, uh, you know, jabs to the body, jabs to the head, following it back, uh, jabs that are just setting up lead foot dominance so he can land his offense. Um, and I really like the fact that he's not shy about taking lead foot dominance and then pivoting off and making a new angle to set up his offense. Um, against you know Erickson Lubin, who I do think is very green, I think those are going to be I think those are going to be tactics that are going to be very helpful for for Charlo. Um, I'll probably wind up doing another round later tonight of um, of Lubin or of um, of Charlo. I'll do round two uh, because this round goes ten. This fight goes ten rounds, which is really interesting because of the fact that Charlo had so much success during the course of that first round, landing lots of power shots, taking lots of angles, and showing that he's not he's not shy about the craft and the skills that he has to display. You know, a lot of stuff that really surprised me. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about. Uh, uh, about the round in the comment section below, how you think some of that's going to play out. Um, do you think that Lubin is going to be able to uh, accurately um, bait out Charlo's jab to land that counter right hook, straight left hand? Um, or do you think that, that uh, Charlo's craft is going to be, he's going to be able to pick up on it quick enough, right? We have seen a lot of him... Um, a lot of the patterns that he's been able to pick up on, right, immediately when his opponent steps with the lead hand, that means he's going to throw a left, a straight left hand. Um, and when he leans on his front leg, that means he's going to look to throw a jab, right, or look to probe with his lead hand, right? So will that mean that Lubin's main sources of offense are going to be uh, obliterated by Charlo's ability to pick up on those simple patterns um, or not? Or is Lubin going to be too fast uh, to... Um, to and really be able to take advantage of it. Uh, so far, I'm in the camp of Charlo probably schooling Lubin. And the interesting part about it, the most interesting part, is the fact that he's training with Errol Spence. And a lot of the techniques that Lubin uses, right, the flashing the lead hand, lead foot dominance, and then straight left hand, that's something that Errol Spence does a lot. So I'd be very surprised if Charlo didn't have some great counters for that. Um, and made Lubin look even more green than he actually is. You know, I think that that's going to play a huge part in it as far as intangibles. Anyway, let me know what you guys think. Thanks, guys.